forging cyber, forging cyber security. Secure Ninja. Secure Ninja is excited to announce our new line of video training courses we're calling the Online Sensei Series. These are on-demand classes available 24-7, 365 at your convenience and taught by the best instructors in cybersecurity. Here's a complimentary taste of Secure Ninja's exclusive Cyber Kung Fu version of EC Council's Certified Ethical Hacker version 8, developed and taught by Larry Greenblatt and Tom Updegrove. This unique series will enhance your comprehension of EC Council's Certified Ethical Hacker version 8 curriculum. So here's Larry Greenblatt and me with the introduction to Cyber Kung Fu. Enjoy. Hi, welcome to Secure Ninja's Sensei Series. This is the Cyber Kung Fu version of EC Council's Certified Ethical Hacker version 8 with Tom Updegrove and Larry Greenblatt. This unique series is designed to enhance your understanding of EC Council's official curriculum for CEH version 8. Now, I've never taken the CEH before, but the philosophy of the Cyber Kung Fu version is that any student with a need or an interest in the certification can more easily learn the material. So let's get started. Here's Larry Greenblatt to kick things off. All right, uh, Alicia, I want to take you through uh, a little introduction to explain to you what is cyber kung fu and, and kind of explain our edge, what makes us uh, different in our approach. So, um, first of all, I've been teaching certification boot camps for, uh, well, since 97, and I have four primary objectives when I do this. I find that most people really need to pass that test. It's the primary reason they're there. But as like a martial arts instructor, I, I can't in good uh, conscience just teach you how to pass the test. I want you to gain vocational knowledge. Um, number three, though, I joke around, and it's quite serious, is uh, don't uh, sound stupid to your colleagues. And uh, what I mean by this is sometimes uh, when you take a test, it's written in, in a language maybe that, uh, you know, we speak American English here, maybe it was written in the UK proper English. CEH, for example, was written in Singapore, where they speak, uh, which I honestly called Singlish. And um, a great uh, um, engineer I, I got the pleasure to work with uh, uh, for a short period of time, but Samit Mahalter had created something called the Semantics of Business Vocabulary and Business Rules. And he points out that not everybody uses the same word the same way, and you might misunderstanding, uh, misunderstand what they wanted when they ask you for something. So at a very high level, if I said to you, bring me a picture of a dog tied to a fence, um, some people might take a picture of a dog, tie that to a fence, and go, here, that's what you ask for. Now, literally, I, I, you could say that it is what I asked for, but that's not what I meant. I meant for you to tie a dog to a fence and take a picture of it, but it's hard to. So you might interpret something wrong, and you've got to be very careful, especially when taking a test, or any time you're listening to somebody for requirements, say, and developing a solution for anything. Um, and number four, get through life using the fewest amount of keystrokes. And that's not just a, a wise guy thing. Um, when, when we do the, uh, a project, we want to manage a project by, number one, we say we call it the triple constraints. I want to hit the scope of what they ask me for, but I want to do it in the least amount of time and the least amount of cost, and that's quality answer. So, uh, for example, I could uh, encrypt your email with your asymmetric public key, no one else would read it, or I could generate a symmetric key and do it, and that's a thousand times faster. So let's do it that way. So we want to get through life a little faster. Um, 
Well, this is the certified ethical hacker, and I remember somebody bringing it up. It's like, what the heck is that? That's like saying a, a certified ethical embezzler. Isn't a hacker a bad guy? Well, it depends on the semantics of your business vocabulary. In many cases, yeah, that you think a hacker's a bad guy. So where do we go to find out in the internet what something really means? Well, at the bottom of the page here, I have a link to the Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, and they create all the standards on the internet, the RFCs. And in RFC 2828, it's a glossary of terms, and they define a hacker as someone who figures things out and makes something cool happen. So that's what we uh, really intend to do in our classes. So when Tom and I created this class, uh, our whole goal was to just make it um, cool and, and have people go, wow, that was really cool. I learned something cool. And so when we're teaching, we're not teaching to be a bad guy. Our hacking is not teaching you how to break into people. We're teaching to figure things out. Just like we tell people, you know, say, hey, the book's wrong here. This lab doesn't work here. And you go, well, dude, figure things out. Make something cool happen. We'll get something. So using that definition of a hacker, then my first digital hack, I like to believe, was in 1977. I got this uh, video game, and uh, you know, obviously when they do a, a re simulated reality, they, they, they gotta get a subset, you can't get all of reality. Um, but they don't just take away from reality, they actually add things to it that aren't real, you could never do it in the real world. So for example, in this limited world, you see our tanks, there's the white tank and the black tank, and we noticed that the boundaries of reality, these, these uh, four corners, didn't work the same. Now, for example, if you went off the left side, you would show up on the right side. All right, well, you know, other people would figure that out, so it'd be okay. Um, but the top was different. You just bang into it. You couldn't, you couldn't go through. The bottom was weird. The bottom, now keep in mind, you're, if you to go out the bottom, you could only go forward. There was no way to back up your tank. So you're going forward. And now, if you could figure out where you were and turn yourself around, you could come back out. But it was so easy to lose direction, we made up a rule. If we don't see you in like five, 10 seconds, we're gonna restart the game. Then things got weirder. All right, so I take a shot with, the, uh, with, the, with my uh, tank and a bullet comes out or whatever. If I turned my tank, my bullet would also turn. Now that could never happen in reality, so you could learn to how to shoot around corners. So that is pretty freaky, but even your friend might catch that in the same game. I can do that too. But the coolest thing only I was able to make that I know of in my team of friends was, it was like a, a little weird spot right here, like one pixel wide, where if you went up here, you actually could pass through and you come right at the bottom. Huh. So you could pause there and you could shoot there and as a tank is going through here, the shot would come out of nowhere. It's like, how'd you do that, dude? Um, but you could also push your, your tank through there, but it was such a fine line, mo mo none of my friends could actually find it in the game. So that's why I was able to beat most of my friends. I, I, I just figured something out, I made something cool happen, and uh, it's really because of the way it failed. And I've heard people say that, that's what hacking is. It's like, all right, so this thing can hold 100 pounds, that's what it says. What would happen if I put 101 pounds on it? So what will happen when you make it fail? Will it do something cool? All right, so how long, I just so people, I've been involved in martial arts most of my life, and Tom has been my coach most of that time, um, but I've also been involved in IT for a long time. So I got involved in IT, actually, as a band member, um, one of the, uh, uh, my engineer, Otto, uh, said his brother went to computer repair school and got a job, and Otto had a computer in the recording studio. Tom, my uh, martial arts instructor, had a computer. I was like, I want to learn more. So I went to one of these computer repair schools, and you'll see this is my, uh, this is 1986, I was an IBM certified PC tech. Uh, networks were starting to come out, I was a Novell guy, actually since 4.6.1, but the first cert they had. And my cert says 1990, but that's because I lost my original paper. I was actually a Novell CNE in 1989. In 1988, I was at IBM Advanced Connectivity, and that's pretty funny, it's when I learned that TCP IP is dead. Yeah, the government's already signed off. It's going to be phased out. We're moving to the OSI. Uh, long story there. Um, CEH since uh, 2002. And I was a Cisco certified network professional with security specialists in 2000. And I, the very first hacking course I ever heard of was uh, Ultimate Hacking Hands On by Foundstone. They wrote Hacking Exposed, and I took that in 2001. And I don't know that makes me smart. It just makes me the master of multiple choice or whatever. I've always been lucky enough to know people way smarter than me, so I'm trying to get cocky. I just want the, the, uh, anybody home to know I've been involved for a while. 
Um, my mother is really funny, and you're going to hear a lot about her through the course. She's influenced me a lot. And she reads these things, and she gets so nervous. She goes, oh, God, Larry, I just read that they can do something on cell phones. Is that true? They can spy on you? And I go, yeah. And when you're not even on the phone, yeah, it's true. And she goes, oh, I wouldn't want to be growing up today. It's so scary. And, you know, it always seems scary to that generation. Whatever problems you have, uh, and I heard uh, a former general, uh, uh, retired general Mike Hayden at Black Hat, uh, gave a speech, and I loved it. He said, what did his father address this up? He said, what would my father say? Quit whining, act like a man, and just defend yourself. So, uh, Alicia, this is for me. No, no, I'm sorry, I'm sure it's a semantic transfer. Uh, so, uh, my mother also uh, can tell you how the, uh, the Greek origin for anything. She's sometimes like the father of my big fat Greek wedding. So she's taught me to play with words a lot. And I found it funny that uh, uh, I wanted to create a martial art. Now. Um, the history of martial arts in the United States, or perhaps the most famous, is, is Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee says, you know, martial arts styles limit you. You know, uh, the, you can learn a style, but you got to break those rules to get outside because not everybody's going to be your style. So he created his own style. Perhaps his most famous student is Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis um, said, well, why would I, I follow Bruce Lee's style of Jeet Kune Do? I created Joe Lewis' style. He encourages us, don't make, make your style. So I call mine Cyber Kung Fu. And I, it's a play on words. Cyber, most people think, has something to do with computers. But it isn't. It comes from the Greek. Uh, it's the same root word as uh, for govern, kybernum. And a kybern was the, uh, the helmsman of a ship. He had to steer. So the cyber, uh, actually Norbert Wiener coined the term probably first in the U.S., cybernetics. And his, his um, idea was, why would a human, an animal, or even a machine pick a direction? Right. Um, and Kung Fu is another misunderstood term. Many people think it means something to do with martial arts, but actually Kung, or sometimes pronounced Gong, uh, same as uh, like um, Gung Ho, uh, it means something to spend work or time or energy on a subject. So people would like look at Kung Fu masters and like, oh my gosh, what's the secret? The secret was he spent a lot of time and energy on it. If you just got behind the wheel of your car to steer, you can only steer so well. But if you spend a lot of time and energy behind that wheel, you become a good driver. And that's, that's the secret. And food just means man. So once again, this is for man food. No, no, again, I, I'm sure it's man. Please, people, if you're listening at home, I grew up with my mother, my two older sisters, and I've had three daughters. And I, so I, trust me, I know I'm just, just picking like that fun. Um, I've been involved in martial arts since I was a little kid. Uh, I was, well, my grandfather was a boxer, and they, uh, my father was a, a wrestler and a boxer. Um, and I've always been interested in martial arts, and karate comes up, and uh, you know, the TV show Kung Fu is out, and I'm a little kid, I gotta learn, I wanna learn this stuff. And, but every school I visited, there was like a master, and you had to bow. And I'm a, a street kid, and I just, even at 12 years old, I had these pompous masters, and, and this is what would happen, I'm like, <laughs> Not if I got you to look over there and clock you upside the head with a bottle. You know, I just didn't feel they had streetwise. And then I met Tom, and I remember, um, besides the fact that he didn't seem formal and bowing and stuff, uh, he also never came at us as a master. He said, ah, I hate masters. Masters have followers. You know, I, I, like, I like to think I'm a coach, and I'm, I'm helping star players. And I love that. And his teacher, Joe Lewis, also uh, I later became uh, certified under Joe. Uh, Joe, one of the most profound talks I ever heard, him, said, um, guys, I can't stand followers, so please do not follow me. He's a tough old Marine, talked a little hard. He goes, he goes think about it. I like to think that um, if, when I make a mistake in life, I can get some help from somebody. And if I make a mistake in life and all I got are followers, do you think they can help me? They're going to make the same mistake I made. He said, so a good leader is not going to have a follower. He's going to have fellowships with other leaders. And he stressed that. Don't follow people. and Don't encourage people to follow. So we're coaches. A coach's job is to share their experience. I've been there before. I drove to, I, I steered through those waters. And I can share that to prepare you for, the, for that voyage. I can present information to you because I, I, honestly, I can guide you along. You're like, oh, I, I know you're actually, your foot's a little out of the way. Or watch out, you're hitting backslash instead of forward slash. Inspire, it comes from the Greek. It means to give breath, right? Uh, to, to, inspire, to, to give life. And hopefully when we, we tell these stories and we use our, our analogies, people tell me it, it does bring it to life. And encourage, obviously, don't be afraid. And it's funny, you know, I tell people, if I put a thousand pound weight in front of you and I go, just believe in yourself, man, you can do it. <laughs> no, you can't live that. But this is a multiple choice test. Trust me, you can get a hundred, you can do it. Um, but we're not masters. I hate masters. They rule slaves. A coach is a server. I'm there to serve you. You're the star player. 
So our coaches uh, through others, uh, my, my um, coach for over 30 years is Tom Updegrove. Uh, Tom's been, uh, actually he's a professional in IT since 1999, he, he became a Microsoft and a Cisco reseller, but actually he's the first, one of the first two people I know to have a computer. So I met Tom, he had a little Tandy computer, and he went, or maybe it would have been Texas Instruments, then a Tandy, Commodore 64, Commodore Amiga, he's always been hacking on these things. Uh, but I got him involved in, in professionally. I said, dude, you can get MCSE and Cisco certified in my classes. And he did. That was awesome. So he started uh, Internet Work Service. Uh, Tom is also an eighth degree black belt in uh, both um, Joe Lowe's fighting system. There's only uh, two ninths and uh, one other eighth. And Joe passed away last August, our, our uh, leader. And uh, uh, so there won't be anybody higher. He's also an eighth degree black belt in Kempo. Uh, one of the first karates to make it to the United States, found by Ed Parker, the man who brought Bruce Lee to uh, big fame. Uh, he got his fifth degree under Ed. Um, Hoist Gracie, uh, the Gracie's uh, Brazilian style re-engineered everything. It changed all of martial arts and, and almost all mixed martial arts today have to learn some form of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Not many people know the reason Hoist Gracie first came to the United States was at Tom's invitation uh, because one of our students had been finding these videos, these VHS tapes, and it looked great. In fact, uh, Hoist met his wife at our school. So. Um, and uh, Tom is a co-founder of our cyber kung fu uh, thing. And I, I love Tom's approach to whether it's martial arts or, or anything. Uh, I, I can remember coming up, he's known me since I was a teenager, and I'd say, yeah, but according to the rules, you know, you're not supposed to do that in Taiji. go, look, first rule, break all the rules. So uh, his point was, you know, don't ignore them. Learn them, learn the fundamentals, but don't get tied up into it. You're too stuck inside that box, you know. Uh, and I, I assist Tom, uh, my, my strength is probably a more professional ability to deliver the, uh, the terminologies and stuff, but Tom is always the guy I go to to actually make it work. So that's why he's leading the labs and I get to talk. You know. uh, my primary job really, I like to believe, is a musician. I've been in the same band, Gung Ho, for over 30 years. I play lead guitar and sing. Um, we've had uh, recorded hundreds and hundreds of songs, which we all could feel. It's kind of weird when you're in a band, like one guy hears it and you, you know, can't explain why, but you just know it's cool. And, and when multiple people feel it, you're like, dude, we know this is going to be a hit. And we've had that feeling over a hundred times. We have always been wrong. So I've maintained my day job and I've been in IT since 84. Uh, you can see I've, I've passed a number of certifications. In fact, um, got to the point where uh, people were calling me the master of multiple choice. <laughs> Actually, one of my certs, MCSE plus I, some of my best guys have no certs, you know. And uh, <laughs> I said, dude, do you ever do any real work? Nobody gets MCSA plus I because you don't have enough time. It was like eight, nine tests. But whatever, I would just want the students to know I do know how to pass tests. I also hold a third degree black belt under Joe Lewis. Uh, I fought um, at his last uh, conference before he passed. Um, it's on YouTube too and Joe did some nice things about me, including uh, loving the work I do for uh, cybersecurity. So that's pretty cool. I got to teach in Okinawa once and I sent him a picture of me with a bunch of Marines at Camp Courtney. And he says, well, how do you like that? Camp Courtney is where I was stationed when I got my first black belt in 1964. And it's also where I left as the first plane load of combat troops to enter Vietnam. He said, now you're my hero. So, special love for Joe. Uh, I also uh, hold a black belt uh, in, um, or a black sash in Tai Chi, which gets like no respect. So I think I'm gonna hit you with my purse. I do love Tai Chi more than anything because it really teaches you to fight old age. Uh, I, I've really never been attacked by ninjas. You know, you go to an emergency room and do a risk assessment. Why do people show up? It's never ninja stars. They, it, they typically, they fell down. Um, and the, number, the top reasons to go to a doctor is I have a bad back. I have bad knees. I have poor stress management issues. And Tai Chi teaches you good balance. It teaches you stress management, it teaches you good posture. Um, but I also do like martial arts. I grew up in a tough neighborhood and, and uh, you know, my friends, well, yeah, if that really worked, Green, what was this? And I have some thug nephews that I never want. I, before they can ever beat me, I want them to be mature. And until that happens, I gotta still fight. Uh, and I hold a third degree black belt in, as I said, Joe says, make up your own style. Tom's style is called Tom Up of Mixed Martial Arts. Uh, actually, one of the great honors uh, of my life, I think, honestly, as a martial artist. Uh, so last October, uh, Tom and I uh, went to our annual Joe Lewis uh, uh, Research uh, Conference. This is where promotions are made. And I qualified for my third. And Tom, uh, surprisingly, that was more of something Joe just threw out. I said he called up Tom to get his eighth degree. Well, while I'm sitting there, I, was, I had just fought. You have to fight for Joe Lewis, uh, uh, a black belt. So in the... Um, 
in the security world, we say we have functionality testing and assurance testing. So for some black belts, you just do forms, and that's, that's functionality. You can show me, okay, you know how to get out of the choke. But assurance testing is, let me see you do that under pressure. So uh, in a Joe Lewis black belt, I had to fight three uh, black belts, uh, including two former uh, champions. Actually, one current champion, uh, Mark Graydon, the current super heavyweight kickboxing champion. And now I'm beat up. So uh, the, the, the banquet comes where they're going to announce the awards, and uh, most people are having drinks outside. And I, I sit down, and I, oh, I'm tired. And I get my seat, and I see this very stunning woman come in. And I was like, who is this person? She, she is glamorous. And normally, like at the meetings, I sit way in the back, but for some reason, I sat kind of near the stage. So if the stage was here, uh, there was a table here, and I was just off. Well, this woman comes up, sits right next, and I realize, that has got to be Linda Lee. That is Bruce Lee's widow. And I just, she sits behind me. And I just said, excuse me, Linda? She goes, yes. I said, oh my gosh, I can't, I, 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 you are radiant. I said, I, I, may I, I'm sorry to trouble you, but can I have my picture with you? So that's me with Linda Lee. I got my picture taken with us. Uh, and then uh, Tom comes down and sits next to her, and then I believe she was flirting with him. That was a little different. But anyway, uh, it was a great uh, honor. And the, the other great thing is, uh, Joe, again, I mentioned, passed uh, last August, and he knew it. He had cancer, he fought it off for a very long time. Um, it, Joe's been a legend for many years, and he told us that he was Bruce Lee's student. He's authored a number of books uh, on uh, Bruce Lee's fighting method, and she set us straight. And she came up on stage, she said, um, Joe, you've been telling people that you're Bruce's student, and I don't think that's fair. I said, uh, Bruce would never have considered you below him. To him, you were research partners. And we were blown away. Oh my gosh, Joe, all the time we think you're running your mouth, you're actually pretty humble. So it was a great honor, and um, uh, it was just awesome. So I include that picture there. And to be honest with you, as beautiful as she looks there, it doesn't do her justice. This woman is just absolutely radiant. Um, one of the things that got me into security, I think, is my mother. Uh, she's very suspect of anything. She's taught me to be very suspicious. Uh, I, I remember I was, uh, I was a big comic book fan, right? So I was a little kid, and there's one there in a, in a comic seat. If you could draw Skippy the turtle or uh, whatever, you know, Freddy the squirrel, send it into this. We're going to examine your, see if you have the aptitude to, what she pointed out, give us money. <laughs> so it was a correspondence art school, and I'm all proud. Like, Mom, look, doesn't it just look like it? And she's... Larry, everybody wins the contest. And I said, but no, they said if I, uh, Larry, trust me. That's what they want you to think. You know what they want? They want your money. And, you know, when viruses came out and malware and stuff, and people were like, oh, well, the first malware, like delete your hard drive or you know, display a marijuana leaf or anything. And people warned uh, later on, well, they could make rockets or, you know, um, uh, planes fall from the sky. And I go, no, nah, they want your money. You know, and, and think about it. You know, what is, what's the difference be, between money and wealth? And I asked that question, I got that from an, uh, an author, Robert Anton Wilson. I go, oh. He says, wealth is what we have. These are all the goods and services. These are all the products that we've developed, the technologies. It's what makes us who we are. If, if um, uh, you know, money is there to trade it, but if you destroyed all the money, um, we'd still be wealthy. It'd just be who's in charge. If you destroyed all the wealth, it doesn't matter whose money, we'd be poor. Well, in 1987, money wasn't necessarily destroyed. But it went from paper in transactions, but for the most part, we don't trade money in gold or paper, we trade in electronics. So to me, what hackers are gonna want is the electronic money representation. That's what they're gonna want. So that's what I've been warning. And when Zeus came out, I was like, I told you so. Forget these denial of service, they want your money. Um, I'm also very suspect, no matter what you, you, you do, so Larry, that's what they want you, yeah, that's how they get you. So, I mean, just normal things. You take her to the Chinese buffet, she's like, and don't fill up with the rice and the breads, Larry, that's how they get you. You eat the meat, you eat the fish. Mm -hmm. But when she's really upset, they get you coming and going, Larry. First they raise the price and now they tax it. So she just very she just has me suspicious when people say to me, "Hey, you know, my car is broken down. Can you help me?" I don't necessarily think their car is broken down. Oh, yeah, really. That's what they want you they, to that's think. That's what they want you to think. And that's how they you get know? you. That's how phishing attacks work. They want you to think it's your bank. You know, that's how the Smurf attack works. That works. I want you to think it's your IP address. Right. Uh, um, and, and what really also helps me understand how to take a test, and I treat it with my students all the time. I said, "You can't come to terms with somebody if you don't understand the terminologies." And when you're reading a test. It's very difficult to understand the semantics of business vocabulary. So she taught me to, to extract the Greek origin. She's like the father from my big fat Greek wedding. So, did you ever see the movie? 
a long time ago. Oh, that's great. So you remember the father, he's like, yeah, you give me any word. I show you, this word comes from the Greek. And uh, you know, he gives an example. It's like arachna means spider, phobia, fear, arachnophobia. And her, his daughter's uh, a friend tries to throw him off. She goes, okay, Mr. Papadakis, where does the word kimono come from? He goes, kimono. Ah, yes, hominis uh, uh, is Greek, mean winter, in winter is cold, you wear a robe. Hominis, uh, kimono, come from the Greek. <laughs> but actually, it's, it really comes in handy, and I'll show you. Like, for instance, I have people involved in forensics, and they never know what it means. You, you've been in forensics, what does it mean? It comes from the Greek, it means to be in a forum. We debate. We don't know what's true. Let's debate and figure out now. We're going to win the debate. Someone's going to win. I better have something that proves it. It's quite obvious. It has his fingerprint right on there. It's evident. And evidence is what you do to help win that debate. But most people don't even understand the meaning of the word. I, I pull it up with religion. People say, I'm very religious. Or they go, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. I go, what does religion mean? It comes from the Greek. Re means to do again. A league, we were once one, and I don't know, if you just go with the best scientists in the world, they tell me 13 point whatever, seven billion years ago, the universe was one, big bang happens, everything moves in a different direction. But re-leaguing to me is to remember that you and I, even when I get in an argument with you, we came from the same thing. Right. You know, I have to remember at the end of the day, we're all one. We all came from that thing. So, so what do I teach most of the time? Risk management. Cyber comes from the Greek, means to steer, and risk, means cliffs under the water. Now think about that. We have a lot of dangers right now. Kids texting while they're driving. Very dangerous to drive a car and not pay attention where you're going. You gotta pay attention. You gotta watch things. Mm -hmm. I have to watch my network. You know, we stress all the time in our class that if you want to really understand, you want to respect your network, you're going to look at it. You're going to look at it, and I like to use tools like Wireshark or Pilot. Um, they're going to have it in your CEH lab. You have CAPSA, Cola Solves CAPSA. They're fantastic tools to look at your network and, and understand it. But even if you do look, there are things you can't see. There's going to be dangers. I can't see the cliffs under the water. Right? These cliffs under the water are, are, are invisible. The only way I would have known about it is either I bumped into it or somebody else bumped into it, and I learned from them. So we always, as I say, you know, if you don't learn from history, you're forced to repeat it. So it's important to respect your elders. We teach the, the students in, in our karate class. You know, it's, it, there's a reason for that. They know things you don't know. Now the kids can get cocky. Go, yeah, but I'm doing something. It wasn't like that for them. Well, that's true. You, you could steer in new waters. But learning that lesson, you know there still could be dangers under the thing, things I can't see, and I have to be prepared to, if I can't prevent, detect and respond. So that's why we have somebody looking out to see if there's a leak in the boat. Someone, uh, it, it, if we do have a crash, it, do we have a lifeboat? Do we have some way to get back? So security is, is about prevention, detection, and response. And risk management means to understand there are dangers that you can't see. Be ready. Risk assessment is to identify and assess what could go wrong. So I look at, you know, what do I have that's important to me? What's my assets that are important to me? My guitars, whatever, my family. Um, but what could go wrong with that? The threats. The threat is whatever, uh, natural or man-made threats. Um, man-made threats, though, are kind of interesting. Man-made threats come in uh, accidental, and I argue that most things are accidents, but we have intentional. So when we're steering, I'm steering my car, um, I could get in an accident, and they're very common. But there's also times when people will carjack you or just road rage run into you. Mm -hmm. And that, we have to understand how to do that too. Uh, risk mitigation or handling is how, when I do something about it. So when I, when I want to handle the risk of driving a car, I go, well, wear my seatbelt. I can apply technologies. Um, I could plan my route and make sure that I'm not going to go someplace a bad neighborhood. And I could learn how to drive. That would help. Right? So if you worry about the risks of running SQL, have your admins trained on SQL. Um, and there's an international standard, the ISO, and many people don't understand that. They often think that this is an acronym for International Standards Organization. Actually, it's not an acronym. It's a word. It comes from the Greek. Uh, and it's, it's actually there to help everybody agree around the world. There are over 160 member body nations, and they've created international standards. And 27005 uh, is for risk management. And um, it's pretty much what most IT search will be uh, following, between NIST and, and ISO standards. 
I also have guidelines from my band in security. Now, uh, I've been with these guys for, actually, my drummer over here in the leather jacket. I don't remember not knowing him. So he lived up the street from me all my life. Uh, so uh, I was, I'm a year and a half older than he is, so we just always know each other. Uh, Mitch, my, my guitarist over here, moved in when we were about seven or eight, and then Doug uh, as teenagers. And we're from North Philly. It's a, a pretty rough neighborhood, and it's kind of funny. Uh, Guys from the neighborhood could always see the weapon potential of anything. So I can remember, I, I show uh, Henry my, uh, my phone, and uh, I, oh, Hank, this is really cool on your iPhone. And, and he'd never seen a smartphone yet. It was a couple years ago. I was like, look, we can see the band. I'm playing as well. He's like, damn, that's pretty hard, dude. Mm -hmm. Imagine I clock you upside the head with that. Dude, you could probably mess somebody up with that, huh? They let you bring that on an airplane? The last thing I would do with my phone. Oh, it's hilarious. But people, oh, it, but it's with anything. It's, so that's the intentional threats. Uh, you know, network op guys like me, I'm mostly I'm thinking of what can I do to keep my phone from ringing from other people so I can just do stuff because I don't want to have to go, it's broken. So I'm trying to keep it running. But other people, how can you mess somebody up with that? He's like, well, I can send you email. What, attachments? How big an attachment? Hmm. 10 megs, huh? Dude, imagine you kept sending somebody 10 meg attachments, boom, 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 boom. But you can mess them up with that, huh? <laughs> Some people just look at it that way. Mm -hmm. right. um, I find it really interesting that binary math got started in uh, Tai Chi. So you, you could brought up earlier, is that Tai Chi, Tai Chi? When it was, um, we spelled T-A-I-C-H-I uh, uh, originally, and that was when we called it um, Peking, uh, the old Wei Giles versus Pinions transliterations. <clears throat> Excuse me. but. Um, uh, tai Chi was actually uh, an old 5,000-year-old concept, and it's what most people call yin and yang. To speak of yin and yang, or to speak of the two separate pieces, when they work together, when they're in harmony, you'd say that, okay, I've reached Tai Chi, I have a balance. And this 5,000 years ago, roughly, in a book called The Book of Changes, uh, where they calculated, they actually created like a binary math system. So you often see this uh, uh, diagrammed around things. In fact, the Korean flag is based on this. So if you look at these three broken lines, that's considered three zeros. And up here is three ones. And a, a um, mathematician, Gottfried Leibniz, saw this, and he said, my goodness, you could, you could actually quantify every number with just ones and zeros. So he was based on Tai Chi, he created the binary math system. Separate from that, uh, George Boole created the Boolean logic system. So it's based on inference. And he says, you know, if I listen to it and I say, is this true and this is true, two inputs, I can infer a third truth. But um, I can also infer a truth if this is true and not that. Or if either of these are true. If neither of these are true, I can still infer a third truth. So he came up with this true-false logic system. And there was an American scientist, Claude Shannon, who said, well, then I can represent uh, Boolean logic on a, an electronic relay circuit. And I can make the circuit, I'll, I'll, I'll come up with, okay, on, when I close the circuit, will be true. And when I go, it'll be false. And I can program it with binary math. I can have this thing do Boolean logic, programmed in binary math, on electronic relays. We have a thinking machine. Pretty sweet. Um, as CEH candidates will not have to know any of these Yijing numbers, so I put those in there as a reference, but please do not attempt to take the test if you don't understand binary, decimal, and hex. So we count a decimal, right? And zero, and then when I get to ten. Uh, so it's really zero through nine. I have, I have ten different numbers, and then when I want to say ten, I got one zero. Well, if I do it with all zeros, I could represent four zeros is zero. Zero, 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 one, one, two, three, four, five. And, well, with four bits, I could eventually get 15 changes, well, 16 if I counted here. But I said I'd like to get through life with fewer keystrokes. So when I got to 10 here, I don't feel like typing two characters. I'll just type an A. And I go through F. I can still represent 16 different values. I can represent four bits, every possible change, with one hex character. Guys, and when you do, say, for example, uh, IP addresses in IP4, you have to look at it in decimal. When you do it in IP6, it's in hex. MAC addresses always represented in hex. And um, there is math on this test. All right, just to warn you. There are older systems too that came up with uh, uh, binary math. I should point out Vedic scholars have, have argued that they did this many years ago too, but as far as I know. Now, I've created a uh, binary uh, concept that I would like some credit for. Now, I know I'm not the first person to really introduce it, but I think in this novel way. So we often hear about things you, th you know that you know, 
Things you know that you don't know. And people warn you, well, it's the things you don't know that you don't know it doesn't get to you. Well, I look at it as like this chest of drawers. Say I have a drawer here that says pants. And when I open it up, there are pants in there. Well, it's a true, true. I, I, I knew, yeah, I had information about that. Uh, and this one says private and it's locked. I, 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 I'm, I'm right. I know that there's something in there that I don't know. There's a secret hidden panel in the back, and I didn't know about that one. So, man, that's a thing I didn't know that I didn't know. But you know where that shirt was I was looking for? It was in a drawer marked pants. A false true is the things I thought I knew turned out to be wrong. And I argue that is actually the much uh, bigger risk. Because when you think you know something, like for example, um, I mentioned, uh, you know, if I wanted to fight somebody and they're, I figure they're faster and stronger than me, um, I don't want to come straight at them. So instead, I'll probably say something like, hey, what time you get? And when they look at the clock, then I hit him. And he thought I was just going to ask what time it is. See that? And that's the way phishing attacks work. I thought that was my bank. That's the reason I clicked on it. That's how social engineering in general works. Oh, he said he was the admin, so I reset his password. He said he would pop. All right, so these are our bigger problems. How the Smurf attack works. I thought that IP address was from my network. So I argue, and I'll argue all through that it's when you think you can trust something, it turns out to be wrong. All right, um, I mentioned the ISO earlier. I said it's not an acronym. And I'm an old Star Trek fan to me. Do the Federation. And I'm like Captain Kirk in many ways. I, I consider them the best thing I know of to get people to work together regardless of the country. I don't care. I just want to know that when I come to a traffic intersection, if it's red, you will agree to stop. And, and when it's green, I can go and whatever. And as long as you do that, you can listen to whatever music you want in the car. That's not important to me. So I, I really support them as, as kind of the Federation. It's the best thing I know of to get everybody working together. But at the same time, they charge me hundreds of dollars for every standard. So I'm, I'm also arguing like, Captain Kirk, why are you beating counters? Just give me this stuff. I spent almost $1,000 getting 27001005, and I'm sorry, ISO people, I paid for that stupid business continuity uh, 2355. It was awful. It was absolutely awful. It had nothing to do with IT. And when 27031 came out, it's a guideline, name it. Sorry, but it just pissed me off. But I do support them. Now, we give people weapons. Um, and it's important that when we do this, we don't feel they're going to abuse it. So, um, you know, it's a certified ethical hacker. Well, this is an old, old concept in martial arts. There's nothing new here. In martial arts, we understand that we are learning as we empower ourselves with, with weapons greater than most the average person has. Uh, as Spider-Man says, with great power comes great responsibility. I if it was a Spider-Man. Actually, I think it was Uncle Ben. But anyway, on Spider-Man. It's one of my favorite lines in that movie. Um, so uh, Joe Lewis uh, has us sign a code of ethics, and I really, really liked it. Uh, and, and do like it. It's one of, you know, now Joe's going to... Uh, hope I don't get a little teary-eyed, but I want to read it for people. I solemnly pledge that I will use the art of karate kickboxing solely for the purposes of defense, never for the purpose of aggression, and will teach my students to do likewise. I will treat with respect both my teachers and my students. The welfare of my students will be my first consideration. I will not permit considerations of race, religion, national origin, or social standing to influence in any way my relations with my students. I will strive to impart to my students an attitude of respect and an appreciation of the responsibility that a knowledge of this art entails. I will never sanction the use of this art for destructive or harmful ends. I make these promises solemnly and on my honor. And I mean it, Joe. Uh, as I said, I, I'm a sniffer guy, and sometimes you have to deal in security with so many opinions. You know, security metrics suck. Like, for example, the fact that we haven't had another 9-11, does that mean that taking our nail clippers away was a good idea at the airport? No. It really is tough to measure good security. I can tell you it sucks. I can't tell you it's good. Um, so the best I can do is look at things, and I'm a packet analyst and a, a big Wireshark supporter. Uh, Gerald Combs created um, a, an open source uh, protocol analyzer, and, and people just, the community just teamed in, and it's just uh, by far the most powerful protocol analyzer, all free. And to me, it, you know, I don't care about the opinion of the user, sometimes the opinion developer. Let me look at the packet. Packets don't lie. Um, and looking at these packets, and I'm so glad Google won this case, because hypothetically, 
I might. I don't consider myself nosy in that I'm listening to your email, but I do sniff a lot. I'll turn on my sniffer, and it's not to see what. Oh, I wonder what you're looking at. It's more like I become one of these old men. It's like, what are those kids doing out there? Going to poke somebody's eye out. So, using caps, a tool that um, uh, they'll get the CEH students get. I typically look at a hotel of five minutes of traffic, not not the content, just the. Who were they talking to? And after five minutes, there were 259 conversations going uh, to the United States. There were 155 to China. And there were, no one else was even close. Now, maybe there was a lot of people doing business with the China. I'm not sure. Um, I kept it running, and after uh, a half hour, there were nearly a thousand connections to China. And this was one access point in a hotel in uh, Sterling, Virginia. I've also noticed um, that the hotel internet service providers in most of the DC Beltway area are provided by uh, China or a Singapore-based company. And I just, wow, that's strange. I want somebody, I would like one of my students to try that. Go to Beijing and try setting up uh, you know, a business where you're the hotel internet service provider. Now, personally, um, I don't know, I'd have to look further, but I don't think these are people typing things. I think it's very likely a botnet, but I don't know. You know, it would certainly take uh, more things. Um, so what's the answer to all this? How do we, how do we get back? Uh, how do we, uh, do, is it more security? Do we just get tougher? Do I get better armor? I don't think so. To me, the best security book I've read in a long time uh, was not really a security book. It's an anti-security book. Stephen Covey, uh, the son of uh, uh, Stephen Covey, wrote The Seven Habits of an Effective Manager, argued in his book, Speed of Trust, that as trust levels go down, time and money goes up. And if we continue like this, we're going to secure ourselves to death. Mm -hmm. He said, look at the airport before 9-11, when we trusted people more, you could show up a half hour before your flight, and it was cheaper to fly. Now we don't trust people, it costs more, and it takes longer, and it's just ridiculous. And he said, well, how do you build trust in relationships? You start by being trustworthy. Because if you're not trustworthy, you will not recognize it in anyone else. Now, I tell you, I grew up in a neighborhood. I don't want to badmouth my friends and guys I grew up. These are people I didn't ask for even my own family. I don't always agree with I've got uh, a number of felons, convicted felons in my family. I love them. That's what I was born with. I just have to do it. And one of my buddies I hadn't seen in a long time, uh, he owns a few bars. He's become sort of like a Sopranos type guy. And he sees me one day, hey, Green, where you live? Hey, you know where the Valley Tavern is? That's my place. Stop over here on Thursdays. You get a good roast beef. I'll hook you up. So, and he tells me business. He goes, and you can't trust nobody, Greeny. You can't trust nobody. It's a dog eat dog world. What I heard from him was, don't trust me, Greeny. I can't be trusted. <laughs> and, and actually, Stephen Covey had a great point. So, to summarize, he says, uh, I couldn't even trust myself. He said, I'd set the alarm for 6 30 so I'd get up and work out. But every morning, I kept hitting the snooze. <laughs> It was like, I just decided, look, if, if you're too tired, don't set the alarm for 6.30, set it for 7. But if you set it for 6.30, I don't care if you've got 15 minutes of sleep, you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's not that easy, but it is, I think, a very um, practical and necessary approach. We just have to become more trustworthy. Stop. And one of the things I loved about being a CISSP, there is a, a line in the Code of Ethics that says, I will honor all contracts whether express or implied. And I think that's the thing, to get back to business on a handshake. Years ago, I started my own business, uh, Internet Network Defense, in 97. I've been in business, and, I, and I've had some bad contracts. Um, I've had some people burn me like that. But I refuse to not do business that way. I've been with Secure Ninja now for uh, almost three years, and it's all business on a handshake. And it goes fine. So apparently you can do that. It's Absolutely. not dead. All right, so in conclusion, for anybody studying for the CEH, the purpose of this uh, tutorial and, and this uh, guide is to help you pass your test by um, understanding, well, how to interpret the book itself. Now, whether you use their official guide, which I recommend you do buy their book, uh, or, or you're actually signed up for a class, this uh, guide that we're giving you is a companion for that and hopefully it'll help you interpret some of the things in each of the chapters. We've tried to map it to it, but without being redundant and giving you the same information. I could have read that. So uh, I'm pretty sure it will help. It seems to help our students uh, with the material, that, the way we deliver it live, and I hope it works for everybody else. Absolutely. Awesome. Get out there and get certified. We hope you enjoyed this short preview. If you'd like more information on the growing list of online Sensei Series courses, then head over to secureninja.com slash Sensei Series. I'm Alicia Webb. Thanks for watching.
Secure Ninja TV is brought to you by SecureNinja.com, a world leader in cybersecurity training and certification. Our master instructors will help build you into a highly skilled and marketable security professional. Secure Ninja, forging cybersecurity experts.